all for coming out tonight. So you don't have to raise your hands, but who here has felt dwelled by all of the, the chaos going around and all the problems in the world lately? Let's talk solutions. So we have two presenters tonight that will be presenting the work that they've been doing for, for, uh, for a very long time. And the first one is Matt Grokoff, who is a writer, a speaker, a leader, and the homeowner of the well-known Mission Zero house, a 110-year-old year house that he bought and he renovated with creative, sustainable features. And the second speaker is Nate Ayers, who is a, the owner of Chihuahua Permaculture, an educator, a leader, and a former resident of Flint. Tonight's event is sponsored by the U of M Student Org, the Permaculture Design Team, and the uh, United States Green Building Council's Detroit and West Michi Michigan chapters. So remember that successful activism seeks not only to be in, to, okay, successful activism that seeks not only to end something, but also to begin something. Okay, give it up for our speakers. being introduced with Give It Up. Uh, uh, so that was an old bio. Our house is now 115 years old and it's been certified uh, uh, a net zero energy building through the International Energy Future Institute. Um, uh, Y'all can hear me, yeah? Good? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Right, uh, while, while people are still filtering in, this is um, uh, just a quick little video. I am water. To humans, I am simply just yeah. I'm something they just take for granted. But there is only so much of me. And more and more of them every single day. I start as rain in the mountains, flow to the rivers and streams, and end up in the ocean. Then the cycle begins again. And it will take me 10,000 years to get back to the state I'm in now. But to humans, I'm just water, just there. Where will humans find me when there are billions more of them around? Where will they find themselves? Will they wage wars over me like they do over everything else? That's always an option, but it's not the only option. So it's interesting, you know, people need nature. The, rea the reality is, is we are nature, but uh, we have um, something that uh, other creatures in nature don't have. My wife's a therapist. And I accidentally came up with a term the other day. She was talking about the, the frontal cortex and this and all the problems it causes. And I was like, oh, the fucking frontal cortex. <laughs> and, and, and that truly is our gift, greatest gift and, and also our greatest problem. Because what, what the frontal cortex does for us is it allows us to think uh, outside of what's immediately in front of us. But nature doesn't do it that way. Nature does things with this immediacy, this adjacency. The way all these things that were just created, these water systems, these fractal watersheds, these waterfalls, the, the, uh, the, the, the entire water cycle, um, it's extraordinary. There's no waste. It's clean. It, it, it's essential to life itself. And yet, it's not designed. It, it assembles from the ground up um, with very, very simple rules. So. The solutions that we want to talk about here, we want to talk about how we can start designing our cities more like old growth forests and less like tree farms. Tree farms seem great. They're legible. You can figure out exactly how much they're producing. Our water systems are great. You can figure out how much fresh water we're delivering. Our energy systems, they're great. Until we stop putting in these external inputs. These are oversimplified processes. They're complicated, and yet it's schematically oversimplified. Whereas in nature, it's diversity and complexity that cause things to thrive. These are the indicators of health. 
Simplicity is the indicator of disease. Simplicity is entirely overrated. Simplified systems in nature fail. They do. And simplified systems that we make fail. And part of the reasons we continue to make them is because the, the failure is, is not adjacent, right? As architects and designers, we look at things, it's like, I can do this. I can get water from the Colorado River and bring it down to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to Los Angeles. I can get water from Detroit or from, the, or, or from a river outside of Flint or from Lake Huron if I want to. We do it because we can. So what we need to do is figure out how do we localize the consequences for these design processes. It's not a real knife, you can calm down. Um, my mother sent to this to me with a whole email filled with stupid things that boys do. Um, so what we've created in all of our systems in Detroit, and Flint, and Ann Arbor, every other city, failing or otherwise, is that we've created this system of little boxes that are not networks, these linear, centralized processes. This is San Paulo, Brazil, which is down there uh, uh, in the fall. But living cities are, are fractal. They work like nature works. They self-assemble over centuries from the ground up, from an adjacency. Now this is actually a schematic diagram of the city of Paris. All right? It's remarkable because it looks exactly like the same structure of a leaf that also self-assembled. So when I gave this talk in Venice, I uh, accidentally pulled up a picture of, uh, I'm sorry, in Verona, I accidentally pulled up a picture of Venice. Uh, and fortunately, I realized it before the talk. But this is Venice over here on the left. And on the right is a leaf. Again, a self-assembling city designed from street view before Google Street View existed, and not from Google Satellite Map. And look at this. It's extraordinary. The longer you look at this, and I've randomly pulled these two images and just put them next to each other. But it will give you chills the more you think about the design that humans made because they didn't design it from the top down. They let it assemble from the bottom up, from an adjacency, in the same way that nature assembles things. So Carlos Raggi, who's uh, uh, an engineer at the uh, MIT uh, Sensible Lab, it's S-E-N-S-E, Able, uh, sensible cities lab. He, he was asked uh, with a bunch of other architects, if you could design a city, uh, how would you do it? And his answer, contrary to all the other architects and designers that were asked the same question, they all had these great answers. I would, I would have apps that help people park. I would do this and I would do that. I would, whatever area they, they would study, that's what they said they would do. That would be the perfect city. They all designed the perfect city in their brains. And what Carlos Ratti said was, I wouldn't. I wouldn't design a city from scratch. Because cities, all the great cities in the world, have emerged over thousands of years by themselves and always from a collaborative and a bottom-up process. So this is a story about my house. So my house uh, was built in 1901 uh, by uh, members of the Gauss family. This picture was taken in 1913 in our front yard. Um, that's Elizabeth and Philip Gauss over there to the left. Philip, by the way, was the saloon keeper of the Gauss Saloon, which is now the Grizzly Peak Brewing Company. Um, and uh, they had a well in the backyard, the same one now that's contaminated with 1,4-dioxane. Uh, they captured rain from the roof. They had a cistern in the backyard. They were essentially net zero water. Uh, whatever rain fell on the site these was either filtered by the ground or they captured themselves and then uh, uh, brought it into the house and uh, used it for drinking water, for bathing, and for irrigation on the outside to grow their own food crops and things right there on the old west side. So this is what the house looked like in um, 2006. It was a great year for buying homes. Um, uh, we were like, hey, Google's coming. we got to buy a house before all the Californians arrive. And uh, so we bought this house. It was a dream come true. It was asbestos siding, lead paint, uh, a furnace from 1957. It was exactly the kind of house that you wanted to make into a net zero energy and net zero water home. So we set this goal that we wanted this house to actually return more ecosystem services to the city of Ann Arbor than we're extracting from it. And imagine if every single building did this. And the reality is that in the future, every 
building has to do this. It is inherently and profoundly unsustainable to do otherwise, to take more resources than you return. Uh, and I love, um, uh, I laugh every time I hear saying, oh, I'm really into sustainability, I want to do something with sustainability. Into sustainability? What's the antonyms for sustainability? Think about this, terminality, death, finality. <laughs> Are these the things we're going for? Of course not. So our house has gotten all kinds of awards. We're in a stack of magazines about so high and several books. Um, uh, and uh, the Atlantic magazine called it uh, uh, Sustainable Perfection, which is really great. I see some of you nodding your heads. But the reality is it's not true. There's no such thing as a sustainable building. There's no such thing as a sustainable anything, any one thing. You can't have a sustainable flower. It doesn't exist. Because all of life, is sustained by underlying networks. So we need to start designing things, we need to start designing them as part of a network. So if you design an energy infrastructure, a water infrastructure, a building, you have to recognize the network that it needs to be a part of and work with nature to do that because nature doesn't do off-grid. For a while, if you Googled off-grid, I came up on the first page and it was like, why? I don't do off-grid. Nature doesn't do off-grid, I do on-network, and that's the goal, is to try to have this as an example of what's possible and where we can go from here and how we can branch these ideas out. Because the reality is that nature's had 3.8 billion years to work this out. And, they make, and nature makes the rules, and they make the recipes. Uh, and those rules are actually very, very simple. So Benoit Menabar, who was the father of fractal uh, geometry, he coined the term, he said, think not of what you see, but what it took to produce what we see. So I asked the question, how do you design a tree? And the answer is, as you already should know, that you don't. Trees emerge. They self-assemble. They're part of networks. They're life-enhancing. They're part of a platform that helps create complex adaptive systems. And if you look throughout the natural world, it's utterly fascinating, whether it's a tree, or a watershed, or the capillaries of your lungs, or neurons in your brain, they all have the same mathematics. They follow what's called Murray's Law, right? This, this branching, there's actually branching algorithms based on this. And there's a reason that it does that, because it's optimal. It may not be perfectly efficient, but it's optimal. Much better than efficiency for what we go through. And you start finding these patterns in nature that follow these same mathematical rules and principles everywhere you look. A spiral in a rose is the same as in a cactus. It's the same as in the tub in your drain. It's the same in hurricanes. It's the same spiral, the same mathematical spiral of the, of the structure of the universe. And when you really dig down and push these ideas against the wall, it's like you realize well, they have to be that way. If they're going to self-assemble, it all has to be based on some simple rules so that when it repeats, it will look the same at this scale, at this scale, at this scale, or the size of the universe. That's what fractal means. It's self-similarity repeated at every scale. So how do we design our water systems? We don't uh, use fractals. In fact, we've severed the fractal relationship with water. We laid it over nature on top of it, and we do what's a very oversimplified, ingenious, Mind you, right? I'm not criticizing the engineers who created our system you know, in the 1920s and 30s, or turn of the turn of the last century. It's absolutely ingenious, and it works until it doesn't. When it fails, it fails big, because that's what happens with oversimplified systems. So we have this three-pipe system. One pipe, clean water in. Average American, 300 gallons a day. Right? Clean water in, one pipe. We shit in it, we pee in it, we put our tampons in it, we drink it, not in that order. <laughs> and then we put it into another pipe. And the city of Ann Arbor calls it the sanitary tap. And everybody, if you go flush a toilet in Water Hill, your toilet will go into the same pipe that somebody in Sio Township when they poop and flush their toilet. Your poop will meet their path somewhere along the way. And if you go over to the over old bus side right across from West Park, um, uh, sort of near Water Hill, uh, you'll smell it, the water from Sio Township, because apparently something's going wrong with the system. I haven't investigated what it is. But for the past year, there's this incredible sewer stench in Ann Arbor. 
this entire neighborhood. Now the neighbors are starting to complain about it. And with spring coming, they'll complain even more. One clean pipe in, one dirty pipe out, and then we have a third pipe. We have this glorious thing that falls from the sky, this absolute miracle called rain. And yet we talk about it in apocalyptic terms, and we rephrase it stormwater. Stormwater, something that needs to be managed. And we spend a lot of money, a lot of money, to remove water from our streets and our rooftops and everything else, but not before we pollute it with uh, all the stuff that's on the roof, with uh, the oil and all the crap that's in the street, and then we put it in the street. In fact, this is an actual diagram of our house uh, right over here um, on the property next door, just below this little hill, is uh, a segment of Allen Creek, which is buried in a pipe. There are creeks all over Ann Arbor. You, you guarantee you cross one of those creeks on your way here, unless you're already on campus. Um, and then maybe even then, I'm not even sure where all the creeks are, but there's creeks all over Ann Arbor. Every single one of them is buried in a pipe, and there's storm drains now. Is that, again, so we've severed this fractal relationship of nature. So what we need to do, ultimately, the ideal would be to abandon these centralized systems and completely decentralize them. This is um, uh, Grand Rapids, when the system's working. It's a really lovely system. Uh, there's the river just over there on the left. And when that river overflowed a few years ago, um, people were kayaking and poop in the streets. And everyone's like, hey, don't kayak in the streets right now. It's not really safe water. Uh, because the sewer treatment plant completely overflowed. It's also completely socially unjust, the kind of water systems that we have, that only the wealthiest can afford to do it. If you look around in the state of Michigan, where are the best, the healthiest water systems? They're in the wealthiest communities. Ann Arbor's doing okay. Um, it's not a great system in Ann Arbor, and it needs to be replaced, just like the other ones do. But we can afford to continue to repair it to make sure that we have healthy drinking water. Um, the United Nations declared it as a human right. Uh, but when, again, when these, when these systems, uh, centralized systems fail, they fail big. Uh, part of the problem is, is that they're designed for a list of problems. But what they're not designed for is, is variability. Nature expects the unexpected. Engineers don't. We try to come up with a list of everything, but the reality is, is we can make something look really, really safe. We get the illusion of security with building these centralized systems a tree farm, right? The illusion that this is healthy, because look at all the wood we're taking out of here. Well, stop fertilizing it and see what goes on. Stop planting the seeds yourself in a single straight line, see what happens to that. It's not a forest, it's a tree farm. Um, so this is what happens. This is, uh, this is Toledo. They didn't test for cytotoxin. They didn't expect algae blooms. So they, an entire system shut down, catastrophic failure. I don't need to tell you where this is. This is Flint, Michigan. This is Sao Paulo, Brazil, where they're having riots over water. Why are they rioting over water? Aren't they at the base of the rainforest? Are they get all the water they could possibly need? Well, because they've cut down so much of the rainforest, and the rainforest has retreated so far from Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo used to be rainforest. Uh, they now get their water from a reservoir that is dry, because the rain isn't making it down to Sao Paulo the way it used to. They destroyed their cloud bank, their reservoir in the sky. They took that away. You take away the forest, you take away the clouds. You take away the clouds, you take away the rain. Um, <laughs> this is, I just had to put this away. Um, uh, uh, this is what we're doing. We're pooping in our, drink, in, in our, uh, in our drinking water. So last year, uh, I, I, we took our family to, uh, uh, to Niagara Falls for the first time. They'd never been. Um, it's kind of like Las Vegas with the Grand Canyon, right? Um, it's it's an extraordinary place. Uh, truly one of the uh, ex exceptional wonders in the natural world. Uh, it's been used for a century as, uh, for industrial processes. They've been putting toxic waste, they've been, all the industry goes alongside of it. It only recently has begun to be cleaned up. But one of the things that I noticed was, I was um, uh, as we're there, all of a sudden, coming out near the falls, I see this like foamy water just kind of go through, and I, I, out of the thousands of people were there, I was probably the only one that scratched my head and looked and said, that's not coming from the falls. Where's that coming? It's going, it's going all the way down there. That's sewage. Is there a sewage treatment plant that is putting its affluent into Niagara Falls? Sure enough, hey, look right there. There's a sewage, still to this day, there's a sewage treatment plant that takes its overflow water 
Um, not always completely untreated, but oftentimes untreated water, sewage flows into Niagara Falls, and there's the pipe right there. It's an extraordinary thing. And so then I went over to the gift shop, and they had these little souvenir bottles of water. It was great. It said, this bottle contains authentic Niagara drinking water. Do not drink. Why not? It's from Niagara Falls. But this is why. Uh, this is Ann Arbor. Um, how many of y'all know about the toxic plume under Ann Arbor? That's, that's good. There's a couple, it's interesting because that's the most I've ever seen in any group of people, whether it's a small group of friends over dinner, whether it was a tour that we had at our house this afternoon or a lecture, that's the most, the highest percentage. But there were still a handful of you that didn't know this. this is a, for those of you who don't know, this is a, uh, the largest 1,4 uh, dioxane plume on the planet, I believe. Uh, all of our groundwater in Ann Arbor is polluted. So that, there's my house right at the end, and it's moving every single year. Um, it's extraordinary. So if we wanted to, we couldn't use our well water. Um, this is what uh, Detroit's water grid looks like. Again, nature doesn't do grids. This is what it looks like. And you think about that schematic and how oversimplified that is. This is what a healthy fractal watershed looks like. How do we design for that? How do we design for that? I mean, look at that. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. That's in, infrared. So we're working with uh, Blue Lab at, uh, at the College of Engineering. And um, uh, Blue Lab is better living using engineering. There's Natalie over here, who's fabulous. She's our new project manager. Um, and uh, so we are using, so we've challenged the team and we've offered our house as a living laboratory for them to uh, go through the International Living Future Institute Living Building Challenge. And, uh, and say, how, how do you make this a net positive water home? How do you make this example that, that fractal rule that can begin to branch out and transform the centralized system and become a decentralized system. The Living Building Challenge uses the metaphor of a flower. When it says that a flower has to harvest its own water. It can't go across the street to drink because it's rooted in place. That's the rules of the flower. That's its design brief. Buildings are the same. Buildings are rooted in place. They can't go somewhere. So instead, we over-engineer these networks of pipes to get them to them, or grid of pipes, rather. But nature harvests its own water. It doesn't try to take it from someplace else. It's adapted to site. So whereas we can design a building here in Ann Arbor and build it in Phoenix, Arizona, yet you grow a flower here and you try to transplant that in Phoenix, it's not likely to survive. Frankly, the building isn't either over time. So we need to be able to build buildings that adapt to site the way the same way a flower does. Flower promotes well-being. It actually returns more ecosystem services than it takes away. That's extraordinary. It's greater than the sum of its parts, where our buildings do the opposite. The systems are integrated. It's part of a network. It exists. Its waste becomes food for other organisms that in turn helps itself. And most importantly, it's beautiful. Beauty is the tool that says to us, there's life. There's life. I want to be near that. Because I'm life too. So this is just, I threw these in there just because this is um, uh, this is the design schematic of, a, of the water system of the new, I don't know if you all have heard about the new sun bath spa that's going in, uh, in downtown Ann Arbor. It's a project that um, I'm consulting on. Uh, and they want to achieve net, net zero energy and they're working with their water systems, but it's, it's, it's a bathhouse. Um, uh, uh, that's going to be totally extraordinary. So this is what the city wants to do. This is the, the schematic, right? We just take it from the city, they use it inside, they use some pools, they put some chlorine in it the way they're required to, and then they spit it back out again. Very linear process, and all that water comes from the Huron River and then goes down the Huron River after because I have a sewer treatment plant. This is the schematic of what they want to do. Much more complex, and yet not overly simplified the way the other system is. So what Blue Lab did starting a few years ago was they, they had this theoretical idea of how do we pull out the building just with this thought experiment. If we took away our house and went back to 1834, before there were farms, before there was anything else in Ann Arbor, what was there? And Ann Arbor, incidentally, has these extraordinary maps. Do you know about these names? They're amazing. 
these maps from like 1834 where naturalists would come and, uh, and, and, and uh, survey everything that was on every plot of land. So that they go, go back to New England and, and sell land in Ann Arbor to, to, to people and tell them what was on the land. So it was naturalists who were doing the survey of the land. So we have this incredible record of all of the native species that were growing here in Ann Arbor uh, uh, as the city was being developed. So, and then, and then, so the rain would fall from the sky. It would go through this sandy, fox sandy loam. Is that what ours is called? Something like that. You know that. Didn't you? Uh, and uh, there's names for all kinds of soil types I've discovered. And that's incredibly wonderful soil. It actually sucks up rain very, very well. Uh, and then some of that rain would run off and go into Allen Creek right next door to our house. And there were these deep 18 foot root systems and these native plants, and live oak trees, and all these extraordinary things. Live oak trees with roots that go down as far as the canopy is wide. Um, uh, it's just extraordinary. Uh, and then, what if we took the house and put it back in? How could we engineer that system to work with that same schematic that nature has? So first thing, well, the rain falls on the roof, so let's start with the roof. Well, students test the roof, the rainwater lead in the rainwater. So suspect number one was not the air, but the roof system itself. So we brought these uh, several tiles over to uh, uh, the ecology center, had to put it in their XRF machine, X-ray fluorescence. Uh, and you can see all the different elements. So chromium, uh, what's BA? Barium. Barium, that's what I thought. But, uh, uh, yeah, not good stuff. And, and PB, which incidentally, uh, the word plumbing comes from that. Um, because the Romans had these lead pipes. Um, so 870 parts per million of lead in the, in the, in the worst sample that we had, uh, and chromium and all this other stuff. So it was drinking into the, and the thing about this, all over Ann Arbor, there were these asphalt roof shingles, many with arsenic, all kinds of materials in these things. Um, uh, most of the manufacturers have no idea what's in it. So we replaced our roof with a, with a steel roof that was donated by uh, Madeline Roofing, the company right here in Michigan. Um, we made sure there were no redless materials in it. Uh, we redid, resized our our, um, our gutters. Gutters are incredibly important. I thought a gutter was a gutter. It's not true. Uh, then we take that and we put it through what's this. Uh, we're using a German Vissi filter, a, a WISY, and that's basically just a, 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 a centrifugal filter. It pushes all the debris to the side uh, and it filters out all the sediment and um, leaves and stuff like that. Then it goes into a tank buried in the backyard. And there's the tank uh, from a uh, Google satellite map. Again, don't design from Google satellite map. Um, but it give, does give you a good reference point. And then it goes into the building where it's, this, is, uh, in, this is the actual system that's going to go into our house. Uh, it's in the lab over at the College of Engineering right now. Um, simple system. These simple, it's not anything uh, experimental. These are systems that are already for sale. They already work. They're already working in buildings all across the country, all across Michigan. Um, very simple stuff. This is stuff we're going to be doing in Flint right now, and you know, next week we can have um, stuff up. Um, we're, we're, hopefully, we're going to have plenty of time for questions, right? Yeah. 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 So we'll have a whole discussion about this. Um, and then uh, this is a, a, just a, a schematic of uh, actually that's the existing plumbing. But what we are going to do is split that plumbing up so the drains are separated from the supply lines. So you're not going to be so you you're, you got to you'll have supply coming in, but you have different types of supply. You'll have gray water supply, because I don't need drinking water in my toilet. Um, uh, there's all kinds of jokes we can insert there. Um, but I, I don't need drinking water in my toilet. Uh, they make you actually put up a sign if you do this. And that is legal. You can use rainwater to put in your toilet. But you have to put up a sign that says, don't drink the water. It's not potable. But, so what I'd like to do is go around to all the toilets that are using potable water and say, feel free to drink the water. <laughs> it's just as absurd. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then the uh, uh, and then the toilets will, will actually uh, we're, we've got a whole uh, wastewater management team that's working on this now and haven't decided what we're going to do. But there's a lot of technologies out there. Uh, honestly, the biggest barrier here is aesthetics. All of the toilets that attach to composting systems and use very little water, micro flush toilets, vacuum flush toilets, they're all heinously ugly, and uh, and and that that doesn't work in nature. Um, you know, you, you need that aesthetic beauty as well, and there's no reason that they need to be ugly. A toilet can be beautiful. In fact, there was one on display at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, for that very reason, it can be beautiful. This is a, um, uh, I don't think this is the one we're using, but this is a, and this also from Aqualoop, which is a gray water uh, treatment system that they sell in Europe. And they're beginning to sell here in the United States because 
uh, water stress areas in the U.S. are becoming really interested in reusing water in the house. The space station uses the same water over and over and over again. It's not crazy technology. It's really simple stuff. They drink, everyone says, yeah, but they drink their urine. It's like, yeah, because it's mostly water. They don't drink their urine, but they're filtering that out. We do too. We just have it stored somewhere else. Uh, San Diego actually is doing the toilet to tap program where people were really upset about it. So instead of delivering it straight to people's homes, they're taking the water and putting it in a limestone aquifer first. The limestone aquifer serves zero purpose. Zero. It's purely psychological. Where's the water come from? It comes from this limestone aquifer over here. <laughs> and they're okay. It's like, well, originally it came from the toilet water. But they're, they're, you're okay with that. But it's like, well, where's the water come from? It comes from the toilet. And so there's a psychology to it. Uh, and then, and then uh, any leftover water that goes through a, a gray water treatment system uh, and then goes through a constructed wetland uh, in the backyard. Uh, and that constructed wetland will send, will return all of the water that fell from the sky, will return it back to the aquifer where it would have gone if our house wasn't there. It's extraordinary. And that's somewhat what it might look like. Um, I don't think there's a native in arbor plants, but uh, this is just an example of what a constructed wetland looks like. Um, uh, this is the uh, Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh. Uh, that's the Center for Sustainable Landscapes. It's a fully certified living building. It's harvesting all of its own energy. It's harvesting all of its own water. It's managing all of its own waste. That's its sewage treatment plant right there. It's got full flush toilets, not composting toilets, full flush toilets. It goes through a treatment system and comes down this hill, goes into a constructed wetland, and, uh, and some technology and nature treat the water for us. So it doesn't have to be one or the other, a completely natural system or a technology system. It can be a combination of both. Um, uh, you know, I forgot where this is, but again, this is a, a northern climate somewhere. Is that Overland? Uh, you know, I think it might be Overland. Um, the tropical plants growing indoors. Uh, this is another one. This is a, these are all sewer treatment plants, okay? Inside of buildings. These are the lobbies of buildings. This is on the street of the uh, San Francisco Utilities, uh, Public Utilities Commission, uh, this is a sewer treatment plant for the building. It's, a, it's a, uh, an artificial tidal wetland. So there's a bladder inside that pushes water up just the way it would come up through sand in a, in a tide, and it just goes back and forth over and over again. So we use a combination of electric pumps and gravity to, to make all this happen. But again, it's you know, beautiful on the street scene. And, and this continues into the lobby, too. So the lobby has these pictures, too. This is uh, the Omega Institute in uh, Rhinebeck, New York. Um, they use this as their yoga studio. This is part of a campus facility. This is the sewage treatment plant for a campus. And it's their yoga studio because it's the most beautiful place on the campus. This is where they treat their shit. And it's beautiful. Uh, this is a sewage treatment plant as well in the basement of this building. Urban area, downtown Seattle, six stories tall, fully certified living building. In fact, that's the headquarters for the Bullet Foundation um, and, uh, and the International Living Future Institute, which sponsors the uh, Living Building Challenge. So it's harvesting all of its own water that it needs on site, harvesting all of its own sun, not a place known for sun in Seattle, and it's treating all of its own water on site. This is the Birchie School, also in Seattle. Uh, it's a school, a public school, where we send our children, just like the ones they have in Flint. And they're treating all of their sewage water on site. They're harvesting all of the water that, they're, that these children drink from the rooftop. And to show the kids how much energy it takes inside, there's actually a hand pump that they can see and feel exactly how much energy does it take to pull water up. They have sinks and other things as well. But, and then they also, the drains go through the building, which is not a good idea in Michigan, but in Seattle it's fine. Uh, and there's like a little artificial river inside of glass. So every time it rains, the kids run over so they can watch the water flow through the building so they have a connection to the rainwater. And that water that they're seeing in there is water that they're going to drink later. So it's just extraordinary. Um, so, this again from Benoit Mendelbrot is your bottomless wonders spring, spring from simple rules which are repeated without end. So, I, I, how much time do we have? Do you want to talk and then we'll have yeah. a conversation? Why don't we do that? Yeah. Yeah. So then we'll talk more about this concept and how we can repeat.
people didn't know, tonight's event is being sponsored by the University of Michigan Permaculture Design Team, which is a student-led organization here on campus. Um, the two leaders are in the back, Haley and Maddie. Um, the Permaculture Design Team won a $10,000 grant last year to install a permaculture food forest at the Mattai Botanical Gardens. And you can go and visit that. Yes. Um, do you First, just want to say a couple words about what's going on with that in the PDT line? Yeah, campus? definitely. So it's out at the Mathai Botanical Gardens right next to the campus farm. And now that things are kind of warming up, we're going to have our first work day out at the food forest next Friday in conjunction with the campus farm work day. So I recognize some faces who already go out and volunteer there. Um, do you want to explain the food forest? Right. So we have about two acres of land there and we grow a bunch of native edible uh, plants and yeah we're going to be having weekly work days on either friday or sunday and we have a piece of paper right up there if you want to sign your email on it and then you'll get some updates for us and like us on facebook for updates too super cool group on campus doing super cool things um so yeah permaculture has made its way into upper academia if you can believe it's a really special thing that's growing. I was just out at Western Michigan University last year, and permaculture organizations on that campus, food forest on that campus, so it's spreading, making its way, and it's really exciting. Um, so I'm going to talk tonight really specifically about a bunch of solutions that are applicable in Flint. Um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Nate Ayers. I'm the director of a company called Shiwara Permaculture, and really what we do is specialize in integrating permaculture design principles and methodologies into K through 12 schools, uh, nonprofits, businesses, organizations, and we do a lot of social impact work. So we'll do permaculture-based design installations, get a lot of people trained up, and turn those installations into living, learning laboratories, demonstration sites, and things like that. I do a lot of partnership with uh, the University of Michigan, work with the Graham Institute, work with the undergraduate research opportunities, um, and the advisor to the U of M permaculture design team. Um, I really appreciated Matt's uh, presentation earlier. I think he set the tone up really nicely with, is that the series on nature that, who was the voice of water for that one? Um, Penelope Cruz. Penelope Cruz. There's a, there's a bunch of different videos like that in that series and they're all really great. I think Julia Roberts does one, Robert Redford does another one. Um, they're really good. And I actually have two or three different penis slides that I use in my presentations but I knew Matt was going to be here tonight so I just let him have that space. <laughs> they're really good. <laughs> Is that, what, is that what that was? I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we're lucky tonight in that we've got a couple different folks here from Flint who are with us. Um, Eric and Israel are here. You guys can raise your hand. We'll get a chance to chime in with them a little later. But we're teaming up with them for a very special project we're calling Flint Water Solutions. It's a social impact project. Essentially, we're bringing together a bunch of different organizations. Uh, sustainable businesses, we've got a green roof company, we've got a, a net zero water harvesting specialist company, and we're going to do an installation and demonstration class at the end of April for about 50 Flint residents. Um, you can learn more about that project at flintwatersolutions.com. But what I'm going to get into tonight is really some of the replicable solutions that are available, um, not just to people in Flint, but all over. As we heard about from Matt, um, We've got a serious water issue that's emerging here in Ann Arbor. It seems like you can turn on the news every day now and there's a new city. I forget which school system it was today in Ithaca. is saying don't drink, the schools can't drink their water. So the more that we're raising awareness about this, the more people are finding problems. So we're in dire need of solutions. Um, and so uh, I want to preface things a little bit by saying I'm a big fan of language. Um, I think when we're talking about sustainability, the smartest people in the room are the folks that can speak a lot of different languages. And so we have so many different groups and municipalities and organizations and businesses that are talking about sustainability and solutions and things like that, but they might be using different language. And so I think it behooves us as folks that are interested in solutions to be able to learn these different languages because we could be talking about the exact same things, the exact same solutions, just using different languages, different words, and think that we're not on the same page. So I'm going to talk tonight about this concept of green infrastructure. 
which if you do a little bit of research, this is really being promoted by the government and the Environmental Protection Agency and the White House and municipal bodies and government bodies like that. Um, my background is in permaculture, which is essentially nature-based systems thinking and biomimicry. But when I start reading this literature that's coming out from whitehouse.gov and the EPA and they're talking about green infrastructure, that's exactly what I've been learning and teaching about in permaculture for the past 10 years. So I want to preface what I'm going to talk about tonight by um, saying I'm going to hit you right out the front with a bunch of different texts, with a bunch of different people's definitions about things. And what I'm going to show you in the second half of the presentation is how these solutions are really all synonymous. Green infrastructure, permaculture, um, we're talking about being able to integrate human need within natural patterns of abundance. So, the smartest of those among us are those that can speak a lot of different languages. Green infrastructure. Um, let's talk about what's going on here in our cities. Uh, we've built these very, um, over, oftentimes, uh, over the complex infrastructure systems that, as Matt was talking about, do a lot of different things to our water. Um, we have decided that we're going to use this word stormwater runoff um, and sort of try and divert water away from our buildings and places where we uh, like to habitate, things like that. The problem is, is that when rain falls on our roofs, streets, and things like that, it doesn't get sunk into the ground like it should. Like it would in a natural sort of uh, wetland or forest or meadow or place of natural beauty. And the issue is that a lot of times this stormwater carries everything from the roof, from the roads, all the trash, the bacteria, and it goes into our rivers, lakes, and streams. So as Matt mentioned earlier, we had a situation last summer in Toledo where the farm runoff from all the farm basins in Lake Erie carrying nitrates and things like that created this massive algae bloom. And for about two weeks, folks in Flint could not drink their water. All because of what was happening every time it rained, rainwater washing off of farms. So this is a serious problem, and green infrastructure ultimately attempts to deal with how we can reintegrate our needs with natural patterns, natural solutions. So the big problem we're talking about here is stormwater management and centralized water treatment systems. That's what we're trying to address. That's what we're trying to find some solutions for. And what green infrastructure and permaculture is going to tell us is that nature-based decentralized systems of water catchment, storage, filtration, and integrating those storage need, uh, usage with human needs is really the direction that we want to start looking in. Really going back to nature, back to source. So I know this is a no-no, lots of text in a, in a big presentation like this. But I wanted you to see this because this is coming from the EPA.gov. Green infrastructure uses plants, soils, and nature itself to manage stormwater and create healthy urban environments. Green infrastructure practices can be used to reduce the need for expensive gray water infrastructure pipes, storage facilities, and treatment systems because plants and soil soak up, store, and use the rainwater. Communities also can create or preserve existing vegetated areas to maintain a high quality of life for residents through flood protection, cleaner air and water, and more appealing transportation corridors and outdoor spaces. And that's coming from EPA.gov. So they're encouraging us to look to nature for solutions to these problems that we're facing. A lot of talk about rivers from AmericanRivers.org. I'm going to read the second paragraph. Green infrastructure solutions can be applied on different scales from the house or building level to the broader landscape level. On the local level, green infrastructure practices include rain gardens, permeable pavements, green roofs, infiltration planters, trees and tree boxes, tree boxes, and rainwater harvesting systems. At the largest scale, the preservation and restoration of natural landscapes, such as forests, floodplains, and wetlands, are critical components of green infrastructure. So this is important because we're talking about the scalability of these solutions. Whether you're living in an apartment building, or you're on 10,000 acres, there are applicable green infrastructure solutions that can help us mimic nature, process, catch, store, purify, filter rainwater in far more natural ways than the systems that we become used to these days. So, the calculation. We can't get away with being here at the University of Michigan without including a little bit of math in tonight's presentation. But this is a really important calculation that everybody here can learn, and you will use this from here on out. I promise you, it's simple. When we want to talk about the amount of rain that comes off of our buildings, whether it's a house, a barn, an apartment building, or something like that, there's a very simple mathematical calculation that we can use to figure out how many gallons of water are coming off in a particular rain event or a rainstorm. And that calculation is the catchment area, which is usually the square foot of the, wood, the roof space. And incidentally enough, a lot of times, that square footage is very close to the actual square footage of the house 
modern American house is somewhere around 1,200 square feet. So the catchment area is the square footage times the rainfall depth. So if we have a rain event of, let's say, one inch, then if we want to convert that into the gallons, how many gallons is coming off, we multiply it by 0.623. That gives us a total of how many harvested gallons of water are coming off of our impermeable surface, typically a roof. So for example, if we have a 1,200 square foot roof and we get one inch of rain times 0.263 to convert it into gallons, that's going to total 747.6 gallons of water coming off a one inch rainstorm. So taking some data from the U.S. Climate Data Network, Flint gets about 31.38 inches of rainfall every year. If we have a 1,200 square foot impermeable service, surface times 31.38 inches of rain per year, convert that into gallons, we're talking somewhere around 23,500 gallons per year. Massive, massive amount of water. And the system that we have in place now, as Matt was talking about earlier, redirects that into stormwater management services, which are ex extremely expensive to operate, uh, susceptible to catastrophic failure, and really just not a good system for us to be putting our, all of our eggs into that basket from here on out. But what I want everybody to realize is that we can calculate rainwater storage usage really simply, no matter where we live. So tuck this uh, calculation into your back pocket. Let's get into the fun stuff. Let's start talking about solutions. Here's a good example. You can see in this example here, it's a multi-tiered uh, impermeable service on that roof. They've got a couple different sections that they're pulling square footage from. But they've got a variety of different solutions that they're channeling that water into. Everybody here is familiar with rain barrels. This is a little bit more advanced system, a little outdoor cistern. But all that water coming off the roof has a variety of different sources that it can go to whether it's rain barrels going into gardens. We're going to talk about swales and things like that. Um, so there's a number of solutions that are available for harvesting, catching, storing rainwater on site without stormwater management infrastructure. Rain gardens, one of my favorites. This is really the simplest one to get into. We're lucky here in Ann Arbor there's actually a municipal tax credit applied to those of us that have rain gardens for our properties. It's really simple. It's a little ditch in the ground. You put your downspout going into there, and the idea being that this little rain garden catches and stores water, slows it, spreads it, sinks it into the groundwater, the aquifer underneath it, and it intersects that water coming off your roof before it gets into the stormwater management system. You can grow beautiful plants in here. If we're of the permaculture mindset and we want to grow food in these systems, you can absolutely do edible rain gardens. Bioswales. This is another one of these terms that I'm starting to see all over in municipal dialogues. Um, swale is a concept that's all over the place in permaculture. So this interchange of uh, lexicon is very prominent. But bioswales. Here's an example of one. Side of the street. How can we create a little ditch so that that rainwater runoff has some place to go? We know water wants to follow the path of least resistance. How can we create little divots and pockets? How can we um, put plants and all kinds of other aggregates in there to slow down the rainwater spread. I like this one, bioswale in a corporate setting. Mm, for business people also. It works just about anywhere. It's simple technology. Curb cuts. This is another one of my favorite ones that we're starting to see. If you drive around Ann Arbor, you're going to start seeing these pop up all over the place. Really simple design. Like we said, we know that water wants to follow the path of least resistance. So a normal rain, rainwater, stormwater system, we've got these gutters, right, along the side of the road. We usually angle them, pitch them down so that water flows down into our drains and things like that. Water goes along the side here. But what if we just made a simple little cut right in there so that when water's traveling down there, it actually comes into these beds and infiltrates all along here. If you drive down Miller in Ann Arbor, that's where they did a lot of experimental um, curb cuts. They worked out fantastically. So Ann Arbor Municipality is expanding this technology to lots of other places. If you drive down Stone School Road now, there's a beautiful, intricate system of different curb cuts, and they really beefed up the, uh, the rainwater catchment there using this type of uh, technology. This is applicable anywhere. And again, when we start to get into what we can um, utilize in terms of plantscaping, well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Living green roofs. I'm starting to learn a lot more about living green roofs. I'm interested in this. I'm fascinated by it. 
You may have seen this. Um, this is technology that's taken off in a number of different US cities. Chicago used to be the capital of Green Roofs. Now they're saying it's DC, but certainly Portland, Seattle is also emerging in a lot of these places. It's a vegetated roof. And the idea being there is you've got this impervious surface. How can we put some type of you know, nature on top of there to catch and store that water? It's a couple different layers. It starts with a waterproof membrane that goes on top of the roof. And then you've got various drainage mats and things like that. Uh, the growing medium is what's used for the vegetation that you put on top of there. So hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of gallons can be stored on this system, seeping in, irrigating plants and things like that, before it even gets down to the ground floor. Catching storing water. Now what's really cool, if anybody noticed, this past year in 2015, the country of France mandated that all new construction has to have at least a green roof on it or solar panels. Really progressive municipal legislation there. I'd like to see some of that <coughs> make its way to the United States. Uh, some cool research that's happening is they're finding that actually solar panels, when placed on top of green roofs, work better, are more efficient. The cooling effect of the green roof. This is a big deal when we're talking about climate change in cities. In big urban areas, even in Ann Arbor, we experience this thing called the heat island effect. All the concrete, all these buildings, all these impermeable surfaces. They catch and store the sun's heat, and it gets hotter there. Typically, on average, 10 degrees warmer than outlying rural areas. So green roofs can be a significant advantage when we're trying to bring down that heat island effect, but also for stormwater runoff. Constructed wetlands. Matt talked about this a little bit. But really, this is one of those ideas that's based on mimicking nature's brilliance. You know, wetlands are extremely important, ecologically speaking. The ways that they filter water, the habitat that they provide for different types of critical wildlife. But well, we know that water going into a wetland is going to come out cleaner than when it went in. How can we mimic that in human design? Human design? Constructive wetlands are treatment systems that use natural processes involving wetland vegetation, soils, and their associated microbial assemblages to improve water quality. So here's an example of a constructive wetland. You can see on the right side there is the inflow, and it goes through a number of different filtration beds and treatment beds until it's made its way utilizing these different plant root structures. As Matt was talking about, soil combinations can help out quite a bit. But using this biomimicry to mimic nature's natural wetlands to purify our water. Simple technology that we can really start to utilize, especially in urban communities. And ultimately, when we're talking about green infrastructure, where we might get the most bang for our buck is starting to plant more trees. Trees reduce and slow stormwater by, by intercepting precipitation in their leaves and branches. Um, we've got such good data coming out now about the value of trees in urban areas. Um, this concept of ecosystem services, which is really what is the value that nature provides for us. Um, we've got great data about the value that trees provide in urban areas when it comes to childhood asthma rates. We know that more trees there are, the lower the rates of childhood asthma. So all different kinds of metrics that we can start to look at about the true value we're getting when we really apply nature's brilliance in our surroundings. So here's one little exercise for you to think about. I want everybody to maybe close your eyes for a second and imagine yourself walking down the sidewalk. It can be on any street USA, and it starts to rain. And you're walking down the sidewalk. You know, is that rain hitting you? What's going on with it? So open your eyes, and I want to ask you, did that sidewalk Look like that? Probably not. But what if it did? You know, can you imagine how much rainwater catchment storage filtration is happening in that type of a system as compared to a lot of the ones that we typically, maybe the one that you thought of in your mind when you're thinking about walking down the sidewalk? So this is the value of green infrastructure, using nature's brilliance to assist us in some of these challenges that we're facing. So shifting gears a little bit towards permaculture design. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the principles and ethics of permaculture. That's really what makes it up. Permaculture is an ecological design science, but it's based on principles. It's based on ethics. As permaculture designers, we make our decisions based on how does this affect people? How does this affect the plant? How does this affect animals around us? Um, is it an equitable system? Is it socially just? Is it taking advantage of things? Uh, does it promote one solution infavorably so over another? 
Um, I won't go through all these, but there are 12 permaculture principles, and there are three ethics. Maybe some of the more important ones, they're all very important, but ones that I really identify with and use a lot, that second permaculture principle of catching and storing energy. And that's what we're talking about really with green infrastructure. How can we catch and store this precious rainwater and put it to best use? Uh, in permaculture systems, produce no waste. The concept of trash is a human construct. We invented it. There's no such thing as waste in nature. Everything gets recycled, everything gets broken down. Use small and slow solutions. Use and value diversity. As Matt was talking about earlier, the most resilient and strong systems are the most diverse, the ones that have the most connections and networks, the ones that are most interconnected. So in permaculture, we use and value diversity and we create relationships amongst environments, people, plants, animals, buildings. Another way to think about permaculture, and I've had to define it so many different ways, but when I started working with the University of Michigan, and all these smart engineers here, a way to think about permaculture is really ecological engineering. And I'm not talking about inserting genes and genetic modification or anything like that. I'm talking about ecological meaning, the study of the environment around us, and engineering. How do we create processes, systems, models, relationships? So how do we set up environments, ecologically speaking, where these relationships function for one another? Permaculture is a functional design science. We talked about if it's not beautiful, well then we might not be done yet. But at its core, permaculture is about producing functionality. We want to produce results. Engineers are all about producing results. If it's not producing appropriately, or the system isn't applying the needs that we are hoping to get out of it, it has to be tweaked, it has to be changed. So another way to think about permaculture is maybe ecological engineering, designing systems, processes. And what these systems are really identified by and marked by is being closed loop. Closed loop systems. And what do I mean by that? Well, we can get inspiration about this from nature. As I talked about, there's no such thing as garbage in nature. And we can really look to a forest for a lot of inspiration when it comes to many of these design ideas. So I love these circles going around the trees in the forest talking about all the different interconnections between the animals and the soil food web and the mycological systems underneath the soil how all these things are interrelated. And you can really think about a tree being a closed loop system every year. You know, we know that a tree takes up nutrients in its soil, from its roots. The sap starts running this time of year. Things get spread out. We know that the leaves are going to come out over the next couple months. And they'll be here all summer. And then those leaves are going to fall down in the fall. And they'll break down, become organic material, compost nutrients, so that the tree can do the exact same thing again the next year. It's a closed loop circle. It's regenerative. It repeats itself. It's intelligent. It knows what it's doing. So this is a beautiful model for, for permaculture design scientists to think about. How can we mimic nature's brilliance? How can we design closed loop systems that we see all over the place in nature? Biomimicry. I think permaculture, the most simple definition I can give you is permaculture teaches biomimicry. I think we're going to see this word biomimicry absolutely take off in the next five years. I think this may be the one that unites a lot of different people from a lot of different fields. Um, but really, biomimicry is all about mimicking nature, designing from nature's brilliance. There's a couple classic examples. Here's one of them. Talking about the aerodynamics of the kingfisher bird and how that was used in the applications of designing high-speed trains. There's a lot of them, though. Matt was talking about spirals. You know, The spirals that are everywhere, that are in our earlobes, that are in the back of our head. The same spirals that we see in the cosmos and the Nautilus shell, these patterns that we find everywhere in nature. How can we mimic that? Where permaculture really cut its teeth was in food systems. And this is a big deal when we're talking about solutions for Flint. Um, Flint is another one of these urban areas where uh, the word food desert gets tossed around, like we heard with Detroit a lot. Is you can drive for a couple different miles and not find a grocery store. So access to fresh, clean, healthy food is a big deal. Um, for about four years, I worked in Highland Park, Michigan, designing permaculture solutions. And Highland Park is a really interesting place. It's actually a city within the city of Detroit. It's its own municipality there. And in 2011, the city water utility in Highland Park increased the water rates by about 35%. So even if you did want to produce food, to be able to irrigate that food in your community garden became prohibitively expensive for a lot of folks to do that. So this dance, this interplay between water and food is very important. 
no matter where you live, whether you're living on a farm or whether you're living in an urban environment. 